Praise the Lord and Shalom. Welcome everyone to um, the study on the book of Romans. Okay, are you all in Rome? <laughs> okay. Um, so welcome to all our online students. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. We also like to thank our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture um, later on. Um, welcome to the study of the book of Romans. I have uh, I have put an introductory um, note for uh, the course um, introduction and also the uh, the course content on the classroom page. Um, so all of you those who are online, you can follow that. I think the in-person students have a printed copy of the same. And also I have put it in the e-learning um, portal for the e-learning students uh, in the textbook um, uh, page. Okay, so you can access the course content there. Um, so just a few things uh, before we begin. Uh, during my uh, lectures, I'll be sharing a lot of additional uh, content uh, with fresh insights for each chapter. Uh, and, you know, I have decided not to include this in the course content. Um, and the reason is basically to encourage active participation okay, and attentiveness during the classes. Others, everything is there in the notes you know, it will just be like very boring or you'll not be motivated or excited to uh, attend class because you can just sit and read everything. Um, so that is why I have, um, you know, uh, I will be sharing a lot of additional content which is not there in your notes. Um, so I put that to encourage your active participation and attentiveness during the class because I believe it will just enhance um, uh, your learning experience. And also by presenting fresh uh, insights during the lectures, which goes beyond what is already there in the content, uh, just like to inspire, I just hope it inspires also you to attend class regularly, uh, to listen actively, and also to take down notes, OK? So um, that is what um, I'm going to be doing. And also, if you've seen that, you know, it's, there's going to be um, uh, four assessments, each 25 uh, marks each, okay, after there are 16 chapters, so after each of the four chapters, okay. And um, these um, assessments will also include the additional content that I will be sharing during the lectures, which is not going to be there in the notes, okay. Um, so before we begin, we'll uh, just pause for a word of prayer and um, we'll, we'll look at the introduction to the book of Romans. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is power. Your word has authority. Your word teaches us, corrects us, trains us in righteousness and holiness. We thank you, God, that even as we look into your word, uh, your word is truth and your truth sets us free, God. We pray that even as we study the various books and as we study the book of Romans, the powerful uh, book with uh, deep doctrinal truths, we pray, Father, that we would um, uh, be grounded and firmly established in these doctrines um, about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about sin, salvation, righteousness, and justification. And above all, God, even as we study this book, we will see your redemptive heart. We will see your redemptive nature, God. A God who uh, is um, uh, longs to redeem his people. A God who longs to restore and revive and and uh, protect and uh, uh, and uh, bring back his people to himself so that they can be like him, so that they can be restored to their fullness that is in the Godhead. And so we thank you for your redemptive heart. And even as we study about your redemptive nature and your redemptive heart, God, we pray that we would be people 
who see things with that redemptive nature, that redemptive heart. We will pray into things and situations and uh, challenges that we face with that redemptive nature and the heart of God. And so, God, we pray that even as we listen, that you would remove every spread of um, spiritual lethargy, dullness, laziness, sleepiness, weariness, and God, that you would speak to us in our inner man so that these truths uh, that are so powerful that are so foundational to our faith, God, that we would grow, that we would be uh, strong in them so that we can teach them, we can impart that to others, and we ourselves can live our lives driven by these truths and these doctrines. And so we thank you, God. We bless you. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Romans is uh, one of the most important books in the New Testament. I'm not saying it because I'm teaching the book of Romans, but it is, you know, one of the most important books in the New Testament. And I don't want to overstate things uh, as though the book of the Ro of book of Romans is the most important book in the New Testament. But yet, if you look at Paul's epistle or Paul's letter to the church at, he's writing Romans to the church at. Rome, yes, okay. Uh, you know, the epistle to the Romans is regarded by many as the best expression of Christian doctrine. Okay, so one book that people go to for Christian to learn about Christian doctrines is the book of uh, uh, Romans. Okay, it's regarded as one of the best expressions of the Christian doctrines. And Romans, uh, the book of uh, Romans, or the epistle of Romans, is considered as an important book, uh, both theologically and doctrinally. Okay, theologically or doctrinally. Now, it deals with the doctrine of Christ. Okay, uh, so what do we mean when we say doctrines? Any idea? What do foundation? Okay, what is doctrine? Teaching. Yes. Sorry. Faith. Faith. Okay. Truth. Okay. Doctrine. Background. Okay. Anyone from the online students? So basically, doctrine is a set of beliefs. Okay. Or doctrine is belief or a set of beliefs that is held by somebody and taught as well, okay? Something that you hold on to and that's something that you uh, teach. Um, in other terms, doctrine also can be teachings, okay? Your teachings, what you stand on, what you believe, what you affirm, okay? So here we see that uh, in the book of Romans, it deals with the doctrine of Christ, okay? And also it presents the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a profound way, like no other epistle of Paul uh, explains, okay, or presents the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented in a very beautiful, in a very profound way, like in no other epistle, like in the book of Romans. So scholars, you know, consider Paul's letter uh, to the believers as Rome as an important work doctrinally. Okay. It's a very important doctrinal work uh, that he writes to uh, the church at Rome. Okay, And Romans is one of the best expressions of Christian doctrines, you know, co uh, compared to any other books. Uh, uh, of course, the other epistles of Paul, you know, they address certain elements of, um, of Christian life or of the life of the church. Uh, and Paul addresses certain problems of the church uh, in the epistles that he is writing to those specific churches uh, when he is writing them. But the epistle to the Romans is more doctrinal. In other doctrines, in other epistles, sorry, he writes about. I should be careful. Okay. In other doc uh, episodes, he writes about certain problems that churches are facing. He talks about Christian life, or he talks about the life of the church, or he puts some things in order in those churches. But in the book of Romans, it's more doctrinal. It's more teaching-oriented. Okay. So if you look at the book of Romans, 
uh, it begins with, uh, he talks about the existence of God, and then he goes through a journey of uh, sin and salvation, the gift of righteousness. Then he talks about the grace of God. He talks about Christian living. And, um, you know, again, you know, forgive me for saying this again. It is the best episode when it comes to Christian doctrine and to teaching. Okay. So hence, it's very important to study this book and very important to understand this book uh, because this is the only place in the New Testament where we have about three chapters that explains to us the relationship of the church and Israel, okay? So this is the only place in the New Testament where we Paul uses or dedicates three chapters where he explains to us the relationship between the church and Israel. Of course, Hebrews has some of it in terms of covenant, okay? It talks about the covenant between the church and, and the people of Israel. Uh, but here it's basically talking about the relationship between the church and Israel. Okay. Um, so what is God doing with the church? Okay. If you want to know what God is doing with the church, we find that in the book of Romans. Again, it's very unique from that perspective because it's talking for, uh, of uh, the relationship between the church and Israel. Now, the entire Old Testament, when you read it, it's talking about whom? Which people group it's talking about in the Old Testament? Israelites, yes. So in the Old Testament, we uh, read or we look at God's dealing with the people of Israel and also mentions so many prophecies about Christ's coming. Okay, And then when we look at New Testament, it starts off with whom? Jesus. Okay, and then goes on to talking about the, the believers, the birth of the church. And then everybody's wondering, hey, where did Israel go? Did you ever wonder about that? Old Testament is fully talking about Israelites. And then when we come to the New Testament, it's talking about the church, uh, talking about Jesus' ministry, talking about church. And did you ever wonder where did Israelites go? Or what is God doing with the Israelites? Or is he forgotten about the Israelites? Is he now focusing on the church? Okay. So we see that Paul very uniquely or very beautifully brings about this relationship between the church and the people of Israel. Okay. So that is another characteristic or uniqueness of the book of uh, uh, Romans, or the Epistle of Romans. Now, there are many key doctrines or teachings that are established in the book of Romans. So what are the key doctrines or the key teachings that are in the book of Romans? It talks about the existence of God. It talks about the issue of sin and conscience, conscience your conscience. It talks about the issue of salvation. It talks about the issue of grace, of righteousness of Christian living and various aspects and how Christians can relate to sin, to the government, and how they relate to others. Okay, So all of these are key teachings or doctrines of the church and all of this is covered in the book of Romans. Okay, So we'll begin by looking at when Paul wrote this book. And why he wrote it, and what are some of the things that Paul was expecting to happen? Okay. Um, so all of this happened in the first century, and uh, the dates given there are kind of approximate dates in the introduction to the uh, the book of Romans or the Epistle to Romans. So we look at the background of Paul's Epistle to the Romans. Now, during uh, Paul's second missionary journey that happened during AD 49 to 52, Paul stayed at Corinth for about 18 months. And we read this in Acts chapter 18, verse 11. And that time he meets uh, a Jewish couple, a Jewish couple who are believers uh, who were living in Rome, but they had come to Corinth. Now, why did they come to Corinth? 
okay they were actually living in rome but why did they come to corinth it's because of an edict that was uh, was issued by the roman emperor claudius in ad 1549 and he ordered all the jewish believers to leave rome so they had to leave rome and we read about this in acts chapter 18 verses 1 to 3 and so we see that this couple who were also jewish believers they had to leave rome and so they come to corinth okay and when they come to corinth they uh, connect with paul now why do they connect with paul because both of them had the same business this couple aquila and priscilla they were tent makers and paul was also a businessman alongside being a evangelist a missionary and apostle a teacher he was also a tent maker yes he was also a tent maker okay so uh they connected well and also because the jews and they were believers in jesus christ so all the more the connection and uh, uh you know paul heard so much about the believers at rome okay from this couple aquila and uh, priscilla and uh, when the jews were permitted to go back to rome in ad 54 we see that this couple go back to rome and uh, they would have shared about paul paul's ministry to the believers there okay uh, so do you think that paul had gone to rome before this yes no before he met aquila and priscilla did he go to rome no yes he had not gone to rome did uh, paul so he did not go to rome so eventually or you know uh, uh, it is he did not start the church in rome okay so we look at uh, does he go to rome does he have a desire to go to rome when does he go to rome and also you know who started the church at rome okay now later during paul's third missionary journey that happened during ad 53 to 58 uh, paul spent most of his time in which city ephesus yes he spent almost 3 years in ephesus did a lot of teaching um in the the, the hall of tyrannus you know, raised up many uh, young people who took the gospel who went a uh, preaching and teaching the gospel around the city of ephesus and that is what we read about the seven churches in the book of revelation okay so all of this is connected to the church at ephesus okay so we see he spent a good 3 years solid ministry in ephesus we read about this in acts chapter 19 and then from there he went on to macedonia okay in acts chapter 20 was one we read that and then on to greece we read this in acts chapter 20 um uh, and he would have most likely visited the cities of athens and corinth and when paul was in corinth that's when he wrote to the believers at rome in ad 57 okay so he writes a letter from corinth now why do we say or how do we say that he wrote this letter uh, to the church at rome from corinth a few indicators uh, is because in romans chapter 16 was 23 paul writes about a person called gaius who was hosting him okay and also hosting the whole church and then he uh, he talks of erastus who is a treasurer of the city and quartus a brother okay so paul is saying that he was staying in the house of gaius who is most likely the same gaius or gaius who was uh, mentioned in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 14 another reason that we can say that paul wrote this letter from um uh, from corinth is because he makes a uh, uh, note or he writes about erastus who is a treasurer of the city at corinth okay so erastus is a, a a city treasurer or a steward or the head of public works department and he lived in corinth uh, and a confirmation for this is that uh, you know archaeologists you know when they found they excavated corinth they've uncovered a stone with this name erastus named as adil okay so the word adil refers to somebody who's in the public 
office in ancient Rome, was uh, uh, responsible for public maintenance works, you know, public buildings, regulation of markets, and organization of public games and festivals. Okay, so that name, uh, Erastus, named as Adril, basically means somebody who's in the public, uh, a public official uh, in ancient Rome who was responsible for all of these things. Okay, so they found this uh, inscription, the archaeologists found this inscription, uh, which was basically a, a Roman pavement, uh, which was found east of the theater of Corinth. And um, it uh, this thing that they found, the archaeologists read, Erastus for his adulship paved at his own expense. So basically he paved that whole whole road uh, with his own money. So, you know, they are just giving it like, a, you know, um, like a tribute to what he has done. Okay. So that is another reason why uh, scholars say that Paul wrote uh, the book or epistle of Romans from Corinth. Okay. Now we'll also look at Paul's travel plans towards the end of this letter. Paul shares that, you know, uh, he's heading to Jerusalem uh, to bring offerings to help uh, the saints there. And he also writes, you know, about his difficulties that he's facing in Macedonia and Greece. And he shares his intention to go to Jerusalem, where he wants to give offerings that he is collected from the churches in Macedonia but given their offerings to the saints at uh, Jerusalem. And then he says he plans to go to Spain. And on the way, he plans to stop at Rome. So this is his travel plans. And so that is what he mentions in Romans chapter 15, verses 22 to 23. Okay. So if you look at verse 23, can somebody read that? Romans chapter 15, verse 23. Can somebody read that? Romans 15, 22 to 33. No, just read verse 23, okay. Nikhil. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, yeah. 23. But now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire this many years to come to you. So here we see Paul's heart. Okay. He's, he's, uh, he's opening his heart and he's saying that, hey, that for many years I have a desire to go to Rome. Yes, I've not established a church. You know, I have not contributed to the church at Rome, but I have this great, uh, you know, desire to, uh, because I've heard so much about the Ro Roman believers and I have a great desire to come to you. Okay, look at verse 29, what he says. But I know that when I came to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. Amen. So he says, I know when I come to you, I shall come with the, in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here we see Paul's heart that he wants to go to the believers uh, at Rome and he wants to bring to them something spiritual. Okay, it's not something that he just wants to go and visit them or he wants to visit Rome or see Rome because Rome was a very strategic city, a big place, you know, uh, important city. But he feels that he can give to them something that is spiritual. He can impart something spiritual to them. And so that is the motivation with which he is going there. Now, when we go for mission trips or when you plan to go for a mission trips, what is that that motivates you to go and minister to that city? Is it about, hey, okay, I'm going to that city. I've never been to that city before. So I can minister, but I can also go sightseeing, you know, see that place because it's a beautiful city I've heard. It has some strategic uh, ancient uh, places, you know, uh, uh, or it's re recreational. I want to take a break. I just want to go. So... I'll combine all of these things together. It's a recreation. 
it's uh, ministering and also it's sightseeing okay what is the motivation to go for mission trips is it is is there a motivation here that i want to give them something in my spirit something that god has imparted to me something that god has been pouring into my heart you know i want i have a desire to give so here we see that paul's desire is to impart to them the full blessings of the gospel of jesus christ so he's saying that it's it's something that he wants to strengthen them spiritually he wants to strengthen them in the full gospel of jesus christ that is what paul is you know going around and ministering to people okay and that is why people are motivated and should be motivated to go from place to preach place and to preach the full gospel of jesus christ and that is what should motivate us also okay that we preach the full gospel when we say full gospel what do we mean when we say the full gospel of jesus christ what do we mean look at the early church they're preaching and teaching they were just preaching and teaching okay they were making disciples they were baptizing them but also what else they were doing planting churches okay okay yes their preaching and teaching were accompanied with signs miracles and wonders look at jesus's life he was preaching and teaching about the about what the kingdom of god you know and how his preaching and teaching was accompanied with signs miracles and wonders that is the full gospel of jesus christ okay not just preaching and teaching but also you know helping people to experience who god is so when we say we are manifesting the glory of god jesus manifested the glory of god the early church manifested the glory of god what do we mean when manif when we say manifesting the glory of god two things two things when we talk about manifesting the glory of god what are the two things Okay, science, miracles, and wonders. It's basically manifesting who God is and what He does. Okay, when we say manifesting the glory of God, it basically is manifesting who God is and what He does. Who God is means what? When you manifest who God is, you're basically manifesting His His divinity. his nature his attributes his characteristics hey online students you can also join in you can unmute your mics and uh, speak and answer and also you can post it in the chat section okay so when you say manifesting the glory of god we are saying basically manifesting who god is and what he does so when we say manifesting who god is we are basically saying manifesting his nature his attributes his characteristics when we say manifesting what god does what are we saying this is his works signs miracles and wonders okay so in today when we are manifesting who god is we are manifesting basically what yes we are manifesting the fruit of the spirit to the fruit of the spirit we are manifesting the nature of god and then when we are flowing through the gifts of the spirit we are manifesting the what god does okay so it's the holy spirit that enables us to just like the holy spirit enabled um the uh jesus and the early church all of you with me yes yes no any questions okay so we see that uh, paul shares his heart what he's planning to do now there is a famine in jerusalem so paul is has encouraged the believers of the churches that he had started in Corinth, Achaia, in Macedonia to contribute to the saints in Jerusalem and then he plans to take this offering to give it to the believers there and then he wants to go to Spain that is in Europe but on his way he wants to stop by at Rome 
Okay, so that is his plan. Now, who started the church at Rome? Aquila and Priscilla, okay. Who started the church at Rome? We don't exactly know who started the church at Rome, but what we can say or infer is um, what we know is they, that on the day of the Pentecost, you know, um, the Jews from all over Rome from all over Asia, from all over Europe, they would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the uh, Passover festival or the, the, pass, uh, the, the festival of the unleavened bread and the Passover. And then they would go on to celebrate the, uh, the feast of the first fruits. And they would go on to celebrate the feast of weeks, that is the Pentecost. So all of this was in a time frame of 60 days. So everyone from all over Asia and Europe would come to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast of unleavened bread and Passover, the feast of um, the first fruits and the feast of the uh, weeks or the feast of Pentecost. Okay, So they would come and they would celebrate all of this and after 60 days they would go back to their own uh, places where they were, they were staying. So... Um, you know, it was basically uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of the pa Passover, uh, the whole 60-day celebration would start with this feast, okay? So uh, these two festivals were uh, closely connected, uh, you know, because it took place during the same period. The Passover, you know, what it commemorates, right? What does the Passover commemorate? Why did the Jews celebrate the Passover? Hey, come on. Yes, the Passover that happened in Egypt when the angel of death passed over them. Okay, their, their deliverance from slavery, their deliverance from Egypt. And the Feast of the Unleavened Bread? Any idea? In the, uh, in the Bible, what does leaven uh, what is leaven symbolic of? Or what does it resemble? Bad huh? Bad, bad, bad things? Influence. Bad influences. Okay, sin. So basically the removal of yeast from their homes. So it's symbolic of purity and its holiness and basically leaving behind the sinful ways of Egypt. And uh, so... You know, this was the feast that commemorated this. Remember, God said you should make unleavened bread and eat during the Passover. It's basically leaving the old ways, the sinful ways. And now you're following a holy God. So you need to be a pure people, you know, in holiness. So this festival occurred during uh, March or April. And three days after the feast of the unleavened bread and the Passover, they used to celebrate the feast of the first fruits. Okay. So this was more like a Thanksgiving festival the feast of the first fruit it was the feast of the barley harvest and during this uh, festival the first sheaves you know sheaves right the talk with the grains of the barley harvest was presented as an offering to the lord and acknowledging his provision his goodness his, his blessing in their harvest so it also symbolized hope and promise for a bountiful harvest to come Okay, so that is the feast of the first fruits, and then there was a feast of the weeks or the feast of Pentecost. Um, so the feast of the first fruits or the feast of the weeks, uh, also known as Pentecost, uh, it's uh, the name Pentecost is derived from the Greek word Pentecostos, okay, which meaning 50th, okay, which means this. Festival basically marks the conclusion of the grain harvest and it began the feast of the first fruits. So on this occasion, 
you know, offerings of food and animals uh, were presented to the Lord in a very, uh, in a very extravagant way, in a very lavish way, uh, because people were basically expressing their gratitude to God for the abundant harvest that he has provided. So the Feast of the Fruits was the beginning of the barley harvest, where they would, you know, wave those sheaves and uh, thanking God for his provision with and that hope that, you know, he would, promise a bountiful harvest and after 50 days they celebrated the week of uh, the feast of weeks or pentecost which is basically uh, thanking god for the abundant harvest that they had received okay so during this time you know people came from all over asia and europe to jerusalem to celebrate the feast okay so on the day of pentecost you know uh, what happens there's that noise of the sound of the hurricane-like wind. And uh, who does it attract? It attracts all the people that were surrounding that place. And they came to see what was happening here. And what happens? When they're standing and looking, what is their experience on the day of Pentecost? Their own language. Yes, they heard these Galileans talking in languages of you know, uh, Parthians, Elamites, uh, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, all of those places which they had come from. And they're wondering how can these people talk in that language? And they realized that all of them, they did not know these languages, but speaking in these languages. And what were they basically saying? What were they all saying in these different languages? The 120 who were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were praising God. Yes, they were praising God. Okay, they were speaking about the wonderful works of God, even as they were speaking in their own tongues. Now, um, we see that, you know, some of these um, uh, Jews and proselytes, proselytes are Gentile converts to Judaism. Okay, so they are called proselytes. Some of these Jews and proselytes had come to Rome for this to celebrate this feast for 60 days. So they were present on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And some of these visitors from Rome would have come there, you know, in the upper room. They had witnessed what has happened, they have listened to Peter's. A sermon and they would have been cut in their hearts so God would have convicted them and they would have been one of the 3,000 who have accepted the Lord Jesus and they would have you know because they were spending time there for 60 days you know they would have also been baptized they would have also been filled with the Holy Spirit they would have been edu educated or taught more by the apostles and when they went back what happens? They take along with them the gospel. Okay. So what happened on the Pentecost was basically a revival of God. Yes or no? Uh, you studied uh, last uh, year, right? In your second year, uh, Christian history and missions. You studied about uh, revivals, visitations, and the move of God. So what is basically revival? What is revival? Bringing back something from death to life, okay, or something that is dormant, bringing it back to life. And when there is a revival, there is a visitation from God, right? Means when He comes in His presence and His power, of course, we experience God's presence and power whenever we meet. Uh, you know, whether it's in your supernatural hour, whether it's in your morning uh, worship time at Bible college, or it's your personal time of study and, you know, worshiping God, or, you know, or in church also. But during time of revival, there is a greater measure of the presence and the power of God. And so the revival goes on to becoming a visitation where God comes and where he is 
basically tabernacling, tabernacling with his uh, people. That means he is dwelling with his people. So it's not something that is a, a, a momentary thing, a momentary experience that we experience. A revival actually is not something that momentary. It's not something that lasts as long as a revival lasts for a week, uh, a month, a year. But it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes a way of life. We don't go back to our old ways. It's something that we move on. And we see that when God births that revival and there is a visitation of God, what does it then move on to? Revival, visitations and move of God. Yes, there's a move of God. What's, what's the meaning of move of God? Okay, God moves supernaturally. God works in that place. Yes, it's not that you just as a church or a people group experiencing that revival, but you are so excited as, you know, so much experience God, experience that touch of God, that intimacy of God, that you become that salt and light, that when you go out, you carry that revival fire. You are taking that move of God, you're birthing in that in your specific city or your nation or the nations of the world. So that's exactly what happens here. Pentecost was more like a revival. It was a visitation of God and it was a move of God. So we see that people, when they experience God so powerfully, what happens? They learn, they experience God, they're baptized in the water, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, they're taught of the apostles, but when they go back, they just don't keep it to themselves. Because it's a revival, it's a visitation of God. And revival always ends up with people taking it and it affecting the community, it affecting the society. You know, I mean, you last uh, week, right? You um, In your orientation week, you uh, looked at God's generals. You had looked at different people who God used to birth revivals. And what happened? Did it just happen in their city? No, it was so powerful that it impacted the cities and the nations of society so much so that there was people stopped drinking there was crime rate was down in uh, one city the police said they did not have any work no job no court cases that is revival okay that is a move of god and we see that there's a greater um, uh, greater uh, uh, move for evangelization, greater move for missions, greater uh, move to fulfill the Great Commission. So here also, people coming from all of these places, when they go back, they preach and teach. They don't just keep it to themselves. They become the salt and light, and they establish churches. And so that is how we see that, you know, or we can infer, or we can say that the church at Rome was birthed. It's true, some of these people who had come to Rome, uh, sorry, come to Jerusalem from Rome, went back and established the churches there. So we can say that the church at Rome was a spiritual church. Why can we say that the church at Rome was a spiritual church? Come on. From what I said just now, you can answer. Why do we say that the church at Rome was a spiritual church? The Holy Spirit is uh, like literally. Okay, the Holy Spirit is working in them. Sorry? It started through a revival, okay. Why do you say it was a spiritual church? Okay. Only if you see revivals, do we, uh, sp miracles, do we say it's a spiritual church? That's only miracles guaranteed that it's a spiritual church? Yes, teaching and preaching, yes. We can say that the church at Rome was a spiritual church because, like I said, those people who had come from Rome, they had listened to Peter's sermon. It was not just one-off thing. They were not just baptized in the water and they went back, but they would have spent time just learning from the apostles. They, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they received the teachings of the apostles and they were established in the teachings of the apostles. So all of this is not there in your notes, it's just additional information that I'm giving you. So they received teachings of the apostles, 
They were established in the teaching of the apostles. They took it and they went back. And so we can say that the church at Rome was a spiritual church. Now, uh, the believers at Rome was a mixed group. It was a mixed group consisting of both Jews and Gentile believers. Okay. So when uh, Emperor Claudius said that, hey, all of the Jewish believers have to leave Rome. So all of the Jews, when they left Rome, who do you think was overseeing the church? The Gentiles, okay? So the Gentiles were overseeing the church. So it was almost five years uh, till AD 54 that the church at Rome were led by leaders who were Gentile believers. Now, when the Jewish believers returned to Rome, uh, you know, many of these Jewish believers were under the leadership of these Gentile believers, okay? So that's you know, something uh, else that we can consider and see, okay? Now, the church at Rome, uh, do you think how, uh, where do you think churches at Paul's time were meeting during Paul's days? Yes, there were more home churches, okay? Uh, they, they did not have any buildings because there was a lot of persecution. They were not given any rights. They had no buildings on their own. So they all met in several homes. There were several home churches. And we know that when Paul writes his epistles, uh, his uh, letters were read to different in different home churches. And we know that Aquila and Priscilla also had a church meeting in their house. How do we know that? If you look at Romans chapter 16, if you turn your Bibles to... Hey, where is my... Um, I kept my Bible. Okay, Romans chapter 16, thank you, verses 3 and 5. Um, Paul is basically talking in verse 3 about greet Aquila and Priscilla. And then verse 5, he says, greet the church that is in their home or in their house. Okay. Um, so we know that Paul's letter would have been read to all the house churches just to build them up and encourage them. Okay. Um, we'll stop here. We won't uh, go into... Uh, the key highlights, we'll look at that in the next class because we just uh, have about uh, uh, two minutes before class ends. Any questions, any doubts? Online students, any questions, any doubts? In-person students? It will be good if you can read through the Book of Romans. Uh, you know, it will just help. You know, you can start reading. So when you come to our next class, maybe you would have covered a few chapters. So you'll have a kind, some kind of understanding. Then you will be able to, you know, go back and forth and think and understand it. It gives you more clarity and uh, uh, a more a better understanding. Okay. Any questions? Anything that uh, you need more clarity on? No? Okay. We'll uh, end class. Thank you all for... Um, uh, joining class and I'll, I think our next class is on Friday, right? Yeah, I think it's on Friday. Okay. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a blessed um, rest of the day. Thank you.